I want to thank uh, Umar Vedyanathan, uh, Arena Kadam of our RDOC unit, and Kerry Chiodo of our policy shop for uh, their very hard work uh, and efforts to get this uh, webinar to happen. And as you could see from our late start, we had a last minute glitch, but fortunately they were able to start it out. So I have a lot of material to present today, so I'll just jump right into everything. Uh, before I start, I want to acknowledge the efforts of all the members of our NIMH work group. Uh, these people are drawn from all of the departments uh, and components of the Institute, as you can see, uh, and this was really made for uh, a strong interdisciplinary contribution to the work of the RDOC project. So I want to start today uh, by talking about our NIMH mission. As you can see, the mission statement for the Institute is to transform the understanding and treatment of mental illnesses through basic and clinical research, paving the way for prevention, recovery, and cure. Now that sounds like the usual aspirational sort of boilerplate you see in mission statements, but in fact we take that very seriously here. Uh, if you look at other areas of medicine, there have been significant progress and advances made over the last 40 years. We've seen uh, really marked decreases in mortality in various illnesses from heart disease, childhood leukemia, AIDS to stroke uh, that have had enormous benefits in the public health. However, deaths from, for instance, suicide or eating disorders really have not changed over that time and neither have we really changed the prevalence or incidence uh, of our serious disorders, autism, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, depression, anxiety, and so forth. And so given that we take recovery, cure, and prevention seriously, uh, we had a lot of work to do and we feel that we need to take this seriously and to have these words on the table. So how are we going to go about getting the interventions that can deliver uh, cures and recovery and prevent our disorders? Well, as our director, Dr. Intel, likes to say, the road to better therapeutics starts with better diagnostics. And this is a phrase you'll hear across many areas of medicine today. So why is that for us? Why our doc, why are we attending to diagnosis, particularly in trying to do better uh, in curing and preventing our illnesses? Well, the problems stem from using the current DSM ICD nosological system for research. And I'm sure you've heard a lot about this, but just in brief, uh, to summarize, we know that our current nosologies are based really on clinical signs and symptoms, uh, and these are useful at a level when we don't know much about the brain, but signs and symptoms really can't tell us much about exactly what's going on and the particular mechanisms of the disorder. As Dr. Insel likes to say, this is sort of like uh, calling something a fever disorder or a headache disorder. And increasingly, with our modern neuroscience, we see that the data from genetics, pathophysiology, and psychological mechanisms do not align well with our current disorder categories. Just as one example, we see extensive overlaps in the genetic risk for, say, schizophrenia versus bipolar, bipolar versus unipolar depression, autism and ADHD, and so forth, with a recent Lancet paper even showing overlaps among five different disorders ranging from childhood to adulthood. We also know that there are many problems with heterogeneity and comorbidity of our disorders, suggesting that they are composed of many different mechanisms, many of which cut across the disorders. Uh, we also have a lot of over-specification of the disorders, which leads in turn to the not otherwise specified diagnoses. Another significant problem is that we lack any biomarkers or clinical tests for our disorders, as has been noted extensively. And finally, uh, the current systems gives us real problems for prevention research. As we know in areas like Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease, often by the time you see overt symptoms of disorder, the uh, underlying disease process is very well advanced. And we are learning that the same thing is true in mental disorders, whether you think about the disorders from a physiological or from a psychological point of view. And all of these problems contribute to difficulties in developing better treatments for our disorders. This is a quote uh, from a recent paper by four scientists at AstraZeneca, uh, and it's unfortunately a uh, measure of the problems that the pharmaceutical industry has had in psychiatry that none of those four people, to my knowledge, are at AstraZeneca anymore. Uh, but at that time, they wrote, on average, a marketed psychiatric drug is efficacious in approximately half of the patients who take it. 
One reason for this low response rate is the artificial grouping of heterogeneous syndromes with different pathophysiological mechanisms into one disorder. So it's no wonder that with this kind of situation, we have so much trouble in finding clinical trials that consistently show a benefit for a new compound. So all of this would not be so much of a problem for clinical use. After all, most of our treatments, uh, SSRIs, uh, antipsychotics, uh, benzodiazepines, or uh, cognitive behavioral therapy in the psychological realm tend to work in broad classes of disorders. But this is really a problem when we go after research and try to fund cutting edge science that really gets at in more detail the mechanisms related to our disorders. And so it's about the research. Unfortunately, however, the DSM ICD system has become over the last 30 years a de facto requirement for getting research grants in mental disorders. And thus, getting research grants leads to getting journal publications, doing clinical trials, and getting regulatory approvals. And so the whole machinery of science is governed by the DSM. The DSM original goal for this was laudable. It was to promote a standard, uh, a standard and a set of criteria for doing research as well as for clinical practice. And that's always been very much a goal of the DSM. In 1980, when the DSM-3 was released, uh, this was extremely useful and the reliability led to marked gains in our science. But as the neuroscience progresses, increasingly we see that the lack of validity uh, is generating a failure of the DSM to really promote the kind of research we need in the current modern environment uh, and to get us where we need to go. That said, we have to have some standards and guidelines for evaluating research grants. Uh, if we don't use the DSM ICD system, you have to have some way uh, of deciding what's a good grant and what's not. And so we face the Scylla and Charybdis problem, as you see in the illustration there, when we think about trying to develop new standards. On the one hand, we have the hazard that if we uh, underspecify research standards and criteria, uh, we have a lack of calibration and review, and the reviewers are all over the place, and it's hard to get any consistency. On the other hand, if we overspecify the system and make it rigid, as what's happened to the DSM, we wind up stifling innovation and we don't keep up with the constantly accelerating progress of our science. So we need a flexible framework that hits a happy medium. So this is essentially what RDoc is designed to do, is to provide a standard for review. And the RDoc statement or goal reads to develop for research purposes new ways of classifying mental disorders based on dimensions of observable behavior and neurobiological measures. You can see from that statement, we are talking about brain behavior relationships. And there are four components to this statement. First, to identify these fundamental components or dimensions that cut across multiple disorders. Second, to determine the full range of variation from normal to abnormal. This is a very significant statement because we are not trying to define mental disorders and look for their biological or psychological underpinnings or concomitants. Rather, we're saying, what are these basic functions and how can we understand their full range in a population and consider mental disorders in terms of dysregulation or abnormalities in these normal functions? Third, the call is to integrate across a number of different measurement components as you see. Some people have accused RDoC of being excess excessively reductionistic, and that is simply not true. The goal is to integrate our understanding across these different units of measurement, including people's experience of their illness. And finally, developing new and better measures that are valid measures of these dimensions is extremely important and a major component of the RDoC enterprise. So, Moving forward, how do we think about RDoC? A better way of saying it is not that we have a new classification system and it's all done. Rather, this is research toward a new classification system. The idea is to study and validate these transdiagnostic and dimensional constructs, and I'll say more in a moment about what we mean by constructs. So in other words, RDoC is a framework for research. It's not a finished system we want people to try out. And the whole idea, again, is to use this framework as a set of guidelines to evaluate research grant applications in peer review. So the goals of this enterprise are thus, through looking at these neural systems and behavioral mechanisms, 
to develop a deeper understanding of these systems as they relate to mental illness, which can in turn help us develop new biomarkers and biosignatures. And I don't mean only the biological aspects by that, but also psychomarkers, if you will, psychological cognitive mechanisms. And in turn, the hope is that these will lead to more homogeneous groupings for interventions, whether those are treatments or prevention, and whether we are looking at new interventions or better ways of matching our current interventions to groups. And all of that falls under the general heading of precision medicine. So just a word to clarify the entire RDOC framework. Uh, RDOC has four major components that it's important to keep in mind. First, we understand our disorders now to be disorders of neurodevelopment starting at conception and going throughout fetal development and throughout the lifespan. And interacting with neurodevelopment is the environment, and that is, of course, a bi-directional effect that the person interacts uh, effects on their environment and the environment in turn acts on the person, and we have these environmental effects that have different influences depending on when they occur. So it is in that very important neurodevelopment and environmental context that we look at the RDOC domains and the RDOC units of analysis. So this next slide actually shows you that two-dimensional matrix that is situated within the neurodevelopment and environmental context. You see in the left the five major domains, thus the research domain criteria, negative and positive valence, cognitive systems, systems for social processes and arousal of modulatory systems. And within each of those domains, you see the individual lines uh, that are the constructs, and those are really the heart of the system. The construct is a term from psychology used to denote the idea that these are behavioral or cognitive functions that we think about not as a formally computed uh, entity, but rather a way of thinking about different kinds of functions and validating them through converging sets of measurements. And of course, you see across the top there the various uh, measurements, as you saw before. The center of those columns, if you will, is measurements of neural systems or circuits, uh, which is the, sort of the heart of the measurement system. To the left, we have the genes, molecules, and cells that make up circuits, and to the right, the kinds of outputs uh, that circuits generate, physiology, heart rate, or cortisol, behavior such as cognitive tasks in the laboratory or measurements of uh, freely uh, free reign behavior as with toddlers in the toddler assessment battery, and various kinds of self-reports or interview measures. And finally, over on the far right, we have a column for paradigms to represent the fact that many of the uh, data in the other units of analysis are observed or obtained in the context of specific scientific paradigms. Now, since this is, again, a system that is built on basic functions, you don't actually see any symptoms there. We're really talking about basic functions and again, thinking of mental disorders in terms of things that go wrong. But you can see in the center of this figure, the kinds of symptoms that we might see uh, as examples uh, in these various domains. So there are some important notes that we should uh, make about the construct. First of all, critically important is that the work groups had two criteria we're including a construct, and I should say that all the constructs in the matrix uh, were created by a series of workshops, uh, one per domain, that were held over the course of a couple years from 2011 uh, to 2012. So the two criteria for including a construct in the matrix were, one, they had, had to be valid, uh, there had to be evidence for the construct as a valid unit of behavior like fear, working memory, reward, and so forth, and evidence for an implementing neural circuit or system that actually plays a major role in implementing uh, the behavior represented by the construct. Second, we know that there is considerable overlap among the constructs. Any classification system, even for research, is to some extent arbitrary, and this is certainly the case here. It's also the case that uh, intrinsic regulatory mechanisms uh, where they are appropriate, appropriate are considered to be part of the construct. So for instance, uh, opponent processes or emotion regulation are considered to be uh, a part of the constructs uh, like fear behavior or threat behavior and so forth. We do encourage the study of multiple constructs, for instance, the effects of threat, say, on uh, various aspects of cognitive performance, and that's strongly encouraged. And finally, when we think about implementing new constructs, 
we are concerned with having what we think of as an appropriate grain size, that is, they're not too broad or too narrow. So for instance, perception is a single construct that encompasses the various modalities, uh, as well as, say, just overall visual perception, not splitting up the various dorsal and ventral streams and so forth. So first I want to say a word is before we go further about the developmental aspect of RDOC because we've had, uh, as we'd hoped, a great deal of interest from developmental researchers. And it's important to remember that the goal with RDOC is to liberate researchers to pursue questions that they find most interesting. And so we've tried again with the Scylla and Charybdis thing to not over-specify all the aspects of the matrix. Uh, we want you to be able to do the research that you think is most important. And this is true for development. We have avoided specifying any particular developmental stages because we want researchers to be free to look at those aspects that, it, that they think are most important for their experimental question. So uh, I would reference this paper that you see there that recently came out headed by B.J. Casey, uh, and this quote is relevant. Interpreting the RDOC matrix as a starting point rather than definitive, future research may reveal developmental variations that are not currently captured. So the lack of specific guidance either for developmental stages for or for environmental effects uh, is deliberate uh, and not simply an omission. So just an update on where we are with RDOC now. We've funded approximately 150 total grants uh, overall so far since the project started in 2009. 27 of these have been funded through specific funding set-asides. Uh, and this totals about $61 million overall in RDOC-related funding, which is about approximately 14% of the new Division of Translational Research, that is the merger of the old adult uh, and developmental translational divisions. Uh, and you can see the source for these figures there. So we're very pleased. This is a good start, and we are growing the portfolio gradually as we intended. Also, if you go to Google Scholar, we have uh, 1,600, over 1,600 hits if you uh, search on research domain criteria, and, and almost half of those are in 2014 alone, and we still have some time to go. So uh, we clearly are seeing an accelerating amount of research publications regarding RDOC. Uh, talking about those 150 or so grants, uh, you can search the NIH reporter system to get more information about all of these grants. So if you go to the, just Google NIH reporter, uh, you get a search page and you can search things two different ways. And I don't know if you can see the pointer here going around the screen, but if you look at the right hand center, uh, you can see there's a place to search for FOAs, which stands for Funding Opportunity Announcements. Uh, and you can see there that you can type in the various RDOC RFAs, which can be obtained from the uh, RDOC page on the NIMH website uh, and look for all of them or any one of them at a time. Or if you want, you can go to the text box and as you can see, do a search on research domain criteria or RDOC uh, and you will get the listing of all the RDOC grants. And if you do that, you will get a listing that looks something like this. Uh, and as you can imagine, if you click on any one of those titles, you will actually see the abstract and other information about that grant. So this will allow you to get a really good idea of the uh, research that's going on related to RDOC, both for our specific RFAs and for other areas of science that are what we might call RDOC theme that have mentioned uh, various components of RDOC in the abstract. So before we go on, or as the next part, I'd like to give you an example uh, of why RDOC is useful and the kinds of research questions that you might ask. So this is an example from the anxiety disorders. This is research that I was actually involved with during my time at the University of Florida. Uh, and this is involving emotional imagery and a sample of anxiety disorders patients with many different principal diagnoses. And you can see there the diagnoses listed on the uh, right-hand column and across the page. So these patients were imagining uh, scenes involving their own specific fears that they described to the interviewers and were made up into little scripts that they imagined. And if you ask the patients to rate afterwards uh, their level of subjective emotional arousal, essentially how aroused and upset they were, uh, you can see across diagnosis all groups uh, reported very high levels of emotional arousal, as you'd expect uh, if they are rating how they felt about imagining their own anxiogenic material. <clears throat> 
So if you take a standard assumption that brain behavior should all correlate very highly, uh, and knowing what the conventional wisdom is about anxiety disorders, you'd expect that all of these groups would be showing very high evidence of fear reactivity as well. But that's not the case. If you look at the fear potentiated startle for these patients, which is essentially a well-known measure of laboratory fear that is evoked while patients are imagining these uh, anxiogenic scripts, you can see that by far the patients with a single traumatic event and were diagnosed with PTSD had by far the uh, highest amount of fear potentiated startle. Then specific and circumscribed social phobia and ranging on down to at the extreme right, you have two different samples of multiple and chronic post-traumatic stress disorder. And in fact, these patients actually don't show a significant elevation of startle at all compared to neutral. So as you see these marked differences, and I think the uh, comparison for the two different subtypes of PTSD is most compelling since we talk about a treatment for PTSD as though all the patients have the same thing wrong with them. And this kind of uh, distinction has been noted by many other groups like res uh, research groups such as Ruth Lanius, Greg Siegel, uh, and Namdi Pohl and Wendy D'Andrea, at which they refer to as blunted affect. And so uh, when you think about this, you see this marked heterogeneity in these samples. And further, if you look at ratings on the bottom of this next slide uh, for, non, for non-specific symptoms of anxiety and of depression, you can see that there is also an ordered relationship such that the uh, specific phobics and social phobics have the least amount of these anxiety and depression symptoms, and GAD and PTSD have the most. So you see actually one pattern for subjective reports one pattern for potentiated fear, uh, and an inverse pattern for potentiated fear of nonspecific uh, non symptoms. So clearly, this is a very complex set of relationships, and there seems to be some underlying dimension here that actually cuts across the disorders as we think about them. So sorting all this out uh, clearly is something that we need to think about transdiagnostically, uh, and I would posit that ang the anxiety disorder represents a sort of microcosm of all of these issues that we're concerned about. First, we have these dimensions that seem to cut across multiple disorders as we currently define them. Second, it illustrates the complexity of the psychopathology and the pathophysiology and looking at their relationships and seeing that it's by far a, uh, from a one-to-one -one relationship and we have to sort out these varying amounts of uh, correlation among measures. Third, probably the neurodevelopmental trajectories are very important here. And some of these patients, uh, in fact, may have a trajectory such that they started out as very reactive and developed a blunted pattern over time. Others may have a different trajectory. So sorting all that out is probably going to be critical, both to understanding their current clinical presentation and for developing preventive interventions. And this would also lead to different clinical predictions in that the hyperreactivity patients might respond well to exposure therapy, whereas those who have the more blunted affect might be expected to respond to different therapies like relaxation or perhaps medications. And again, this, we get into our precision medicine sorts of predictions and clinical tests. So I'd just like to review uh, now some design and review issues for RDOC in terms of moving on, and I hope that example gives you a better idea of the kinds of research issues that you could look at using the RDOC framework. So first of all, I'm looking at designs and then also thinking about how you review research grants. The question is often asked, so do I have an RDOC application? Does this count as RDOC or you know, can't I submit that as RDOC? Well, because of its complexity, uh, what we think of as RDOCness, if you will, is not a simple binary distinction uh, like a DSM diagnosis, yes or no, but in itself it lies in a dimension uh, of sort of somewhat RDOC-y to extremely rdoc or rdoc -ian. So what makes an application more rdoc -ian? Well, one, uh, that there are hypotheses uh, about a specific clinical question or symptom, a very specific narrow hypothesis. So we're looking at an appropriate grain size to relate the clinical question or symptom to the construct. So for instance, if you look at the two cardinal symptoms of depression, uh, anhedonia is something that we have a lot of hypotheses about and there are many different uh, tasks and paradigms and measures now for looking at activity in the nucleus accumbens and how that re relates to 
uh, reward sensitivity, learning about reward, and so forth. On the other hand, mood is a very broad, vague construct that we'd have to think about exactly how we measure that and break it down. So you want to ask a question that's sort of related to something that you could actually get traction with using the RDoC matrix. Second, uh, it's important to devise a sampling frame, that is the subjects from whom you will recruit, to provide variance that is appropriate to your dimensions of interest. And there is a priority there for looking at these thin things transdiagnostically. So for instance, if you wanted to look at the something along the anxiety disorders example that I just gave, uh, you probably would not want to sample just generalized anxiety disorder patients because you won't get much range there. Uh, you would only have mostly patients who will be blunted. So you'd want to think of a different sampling frame to include a larger number of diagnoses, preferably spanning that range from blunted responding to uh, actually hyper-reactive responding. Third, uh, clearly there is a priority to look at multi-system measures, looking at across a number of the units of analysis, not all of them certainly, but a large number, and taking an integrative approach rather than a reductionistic approach. Fourth, uh, it's important to come up with a design that includes dimensionality across the measures. This is related to point two. And especially to look at the overall severity of the subjects. And here, uh, we're really looking to see subsyndromal psychopathology uh, to give us a better idea of that continuous distribution. Fifth, uh, as we've said before, uh, it's important to pay attention to neurodevelopment, whether you look at that actually within your study in a short-term longitudinal way, or simply indicating how you could set up a program to look at the neurodevelopmental trajectories across a series of studies. And finally, again as well, we would uh, like to see appropriate attention to various kinds of environmental variables uh, as they affect the questions of interest. A couple of other FAQs for RDOC. Some people have said, you know, I really don't like RDoC. It's just as restrictive as DSM and trying to get my research question uh, designed. So if you're doing that, you're sort of thinking about it the wrong way. You're just sort of trying to shoehorn your question into the matrix. And in turn, it's, it's important to remember that RDoC is intended to liberate you so that you can pursue your question of interest. You have to remember this is a framework and you have to think about, well, what constructs am I interested in? Do I need a new construct? How am I really designing this? That's what's uh, important to remember. So if you feel constrained by the matrix, you should call program staff and talk about that uh, to see how that works out. Another question is if people only can use the constructs that are in the matrix. The answer is no. Uh, we actually encourage people to propose new or revised constructs. But again, remember those two criteria for proposing a new construct. Question is, can I still use DSM categories in research? There's been a lot of attention and you know, rumor that NIMH no longer accepts grants uh, with the DSM. That's certainly not true. Uh, we continue to accept applications using the DSM categories, although we do encourage transdiagnostic approaches with multiple groups and also dimensional approaches, as I mentioned before. Uh, many of our investigators still look at studies using just a single DSM diagnosis, but there you're certainly strongly encouraged to explore some subgroup or dimension within that diagnosis. So uh, I just want to mention briefly the new clinical trials program at NIMH. This is not directly related to RDoC, but I encourage you to look at uh, the pages off the main NIMH site for this approach. It's essentially an experimental medicine fast-fail approach. Uh, and again, this is one that involves a lot of attention to measurement issues that are critical for this kind of dimensional approach. And where RDoC comes in is to encourage the study, and again, not of our heterogeneous current categories, but rather of looking at particular mechanisms or dimensions and focusing on deficits in that particular deficit in that mechanism rather than the broad DSM heterogeneous category. So in other words, you only want to enroll patients in studies who actually have a demonstrable deficit in the thing you're interested in. I also want to mention an important uh, new aspect of RDoC. Uh, we now have an RDoC database, or RDoCDB, which is part of the overall NIMH data repositories. This effort has been led by Greg Farber, Gretchen Nabidi, and other in our informatics branch. Uh, and we have a very strong forward-looking program for data sharing that we think is particularly necessary for this new area where we need to integrate across so many different 
dimensions and different measures to try to get a better idea of subtypes in our data. As you heard from Uma at the start, we now, as of October 1st, have a new NIMHR doc unit uh, that is specifically uh, created to help with outreach and development, such as this webinar. Uh, and there are several different components to our early efforts with the unit. First of all, we are committed to transparency in all of our operations with our doc, and soon we will have an online discussion forum up where you can exchange information about questions of interest about the current constructs, new constructs, general issues with RDoc, and so forth. And you can see the snapshot there from the RDoc uh, page on the NIMH site, and you can see the discussion forum will be coming soon. That's actually currently in beta testing. You'll also see soon an emphasis and a focus number of common data elements for RDoc study. This will be a small number, uh, but still uh, something that we want to see to help promote data sharing. We'll also be promoting online availability of different tasks and paradigms that are commonly used for RDoc study. study. And finally, we're interested in uh, ramping up the documentation of the different matrix elements to help you uh, look at what's there. So in summary, RDoc is a translational framework for research. It's designed to help you look at research questions in a different way based on these basic uh, dimensions of behavior and neurobiology. Uh, and it's intended to provide you with flexible guidelines for peer review to help give reviewers a standard by which to evaluate grant applications and then, of course, give investigators ideas about the best way to couch these designs. And the whole idea here is to liberate the investigators to pursue their specific research questions in a trans-diagnostic manner. That we should be clear that RDoc is not intended to replace the DSM or the IATCD system. Rather, the whole goal is to come up with a large research literature that it can inform future versions of DSM and ICD based on genetics, neuroscience, and quantitative behavioral science. We should be clear, there's some, been some confusion about this, that RDoc is strongly related to our current new trials priority, but is not wholly identical with those things. So you need to read about both of them carefully. In the future, there will be an increased emphasis on an information commons for RDoc that involves data sharing. It's important to talk to program staff when you are creating a grant application to be sure you include these ideas. So overall, RDoc represents the NIMH's effort towards moving uh, in the direction of precision medicine for mental disorders, just as we see in so many other areas of medicine today. So with that, we're going to turn it over for questions and comments. Um, I have put up the uh, a little list there. This is another snapshot from our RDoc page that tells you in case you uh, have a specific question, there's a lot of information already there where you can learn more about RDoc. I've also included the RDoc link uh, or URL on the site. And also, if we don't have time to get to your questions today or you have any other uh, questions or comments, please email them to the address that you see there. So thank you very much for your attention today, and now we will look forward to some questions and answers as they have been coming in. So first, um, we have a couple that came in just beforehand, before the session, and I'll take a look at those first. Uh, one participant writes that there are many basic scientists who want to try to pull together RDoc-based grants, and how does this work for basic scientists? Uh, and there are sort of two answers to that. Uh, on the one hand, our doc is clearly built on basic science, uh, and so we encourage continued basic science in many different areas to give us the literature that we need to promote new constructs and develop new constructs. And so certainly basic scientists should not feel as though they can only work on constructs that are in the matrix. Rather, we depend on the basic scientists to give us new ideas. However, if you are doing preclinical work directed at various kinds of potential clinical applications, uh, there I think the advantage for you is that you no longer have to pick one of many possible clinical applications to say, for instance, well, my research might be relevant to schizophrenia or to bipolar disorder or PTSD. You can say this in an RDoc way would be relevant to many current diagnoses that have, you know, the following kinds of problems. And so we hope that that will help preclinical researchers work with clinical researchers and coming up with clinical trials under our new framework that actually address these mechanisms in a trans-diagnostic way. Uh, another question came in uh, that someone wondered how delusions map onto the RDoc framework. Uh, 
Uh, we've had comments before that uh, various kinds of symptoms like delusions and hallucinations are, if you will, a black box in RDoC because you don't see those symptoms in the matrix. And what we would do is to sort of flip it around and say, well, think about the constructs and that these are basic functions. How could you explain those kinds of symptom classes like delusions and hallucinations? Thinking about the different RDoC constructs, not just one, but how they would go together. And I would refer you to a paper that came out a few months ago in Schizophrenia Bulletin uh, with the first author, Judy Ford, that really looked at hallucinations, in particular uh, auditory verbal hallucinations from an RDoC perspective. Uh, and it's really interesting uh, to look at all the different constructs that were invoked by the multiple authors on that paper to get an idea of how you would go about deconstructing a very cl complex clinical phenomenon like hallucinations and really start to make sense of it in tractable ways. And again, a, a subtext of this is that even something like hallucinations is a very complex heterogeneous phenomenon for which there will not be a single answer for all patients. Um, so those are the two I think we have time for now. Let's see what else um, we have coming along. All right, so we had a question asked by an attendee um, mm -hmm. saying, RDoC is a great idea, but my experience is that the study sections are basically ignoring it and evaluating proposals, with basic scientists not that interested in translation and clinical scientists still wanting to see DSM-5 criteria to, ca to characterize the population. How is NIMH going to address this issue? Okay, so I hope you could hear that. The answer is basically that the basic scientists aren't interested in translation and the clinical scientists want to see DSM. Um, this has been a work in progress. Uh, the first, uh, in the early days, we did see, uh, you know, a considerable amount of that uh, sort of problem. Um, it was interesting in that we've had three uh, reviewed NIMH RDoC RFAs to date. There is a fourth going to review soon. Uh, and we could see a clear uh, increment across each of the three reviews in terms of review, reviewers' familiarity and comfort with RDoC. At first, they were sort of grappling themselves with how to think about it, how to evaluate the grants, but given the overlap in reviewers and people's increasing comfort level with how to think about it, we've seen a much more uh, smooth, consistent review with a better calibration of scores among reviewers. So I think we're starting to see that at the Center for Scientific Review but it does vary by study sections uh, uh, and over time. Uh, I'm going to be going over to the CSR to talk to its director, Richard Nakamura, to see if he has some ideas, and we're certainly trying to reach out and communicate. Uh, certainly, obviously, the uh, members of CSR study sections are drawn from the broad scientific community. So a major goal uh, of our RDoC unit is, in fact, to increase communication about RDoC, how to think about review issues and why this is important, uh, and essentially increase the communication so that people are more aware of RDoC, why the applications are as important, uh, and why we need to do this. We are certainly considering the possibility of someday having more RDoC-specific study sections, but we would rather see this uh, throughout the Center for Scientific Review because of the large number of study sections who review psychopathology applications. Uh, if you have particular examples or concerns, we encourage you to email us and we will look into these. Uh, and again, one of the reasons for the formation of this unit is to try to gather more systematic data about review issues uh, and work on specific remediation that we can take. Okay, next question. All right, next question is, when is RDoC DB ready for querying data for analysis? Okay, so uh, essentially we've just started putting data into the database. Uh, the policy for RDoC DB, as with all of the NIMH data repositories, is the data are shared at the time that a paper is published, and then the variables that are published in that paper uh, are then shared with the community. This is the policy that was developed for the National Database for Autism Research, or NDAR, and we are following that with the other databases. Uh, we have already uh, gone back and supplemented some of the first grants funded under the early RDoC RFAs, and those investigators will be sharing data soon. So we expect papers to be coming out relatively soon. 
uh, and be available for sharing. Uh, we've also gone back and are in the process of sharing data from other large studies uh, that are not necessarily proposed under the RDOC matrix but are highly relevant. For instance, uh, there is the bipolar schizophrenia neuropsychiatric intermediate phenotype study or BSNP headed by uh, Godfrey Perlson, Carol Tamiga, and others uh, that has uh, produced some really innovative data about different ways to parse the schizophrenia to bipolar spectrum and looking at very interesting biotypes. Uh, and these investigators have graciously uh, agreed to share data. So we hope that within a year, perhaps, or two, there will be data ready for sharing. Should also mention that we currently have an RO3 announcement out for people who want to uh, do secondary analyses of extant data sets uh, that could be examined for RDOC relevance. Uh, and you are encouraged to look at that uh, FOA on the NIMH website. All right, next question is, investigators in healthcare services and implement implementation science have found it difficult to frame research questions and methods using RDOC. Will there be additional guidance on this? i.e. when studying healthcare services delivery for anxiety spectrum, how does RDOC relate? That's a very good question. Uh, for the time being, we anticipate that the majority of our health services research will continue to be conceived in terms of our current DSM system. Um, we really are going to have to wait until we get new therapies and modes of service delivery that are appropriate to the RDOC construct. Uh, for instance, I think you can see that if with the anxiety disorders example that I gave, if we reached the point where clinical trials showed that you could uh, develop reliable and feasible clinical assessments for hyperreactivity versus hyporeactivity in the fear system, that could be a very important test uh, that we would want to move into the healthcare delivery system to provide uh, improved healthcare. Uh, but at the current time, these are still relatively premature. We are, however, very interested uh, in incorporating these kinds of things. So please you know, keep an eye on the RDOC forum for the discussions about this. And we certainly welcome uh, the good ideas of all the people in the field for how this can be moved along. Okay, uh, next question is, if an investigator is interested in social engagement as a mechanism, reflects positive and negative valence systems, how transdiagnostic should she be as this affects many disorders? So if one were interested in something that it spans three domains, social engagement in the social processes uh, domain, and then also positive and negative valence systems, what we would say is to start, we've often said that you want to start with an appropriate amount of variance. That is, get something that gives you a feasible and tractable way to get some initial data on in the research question. So, for instance, with the BSNP study, they looked at the schizophrenia to bipolar spectrum, even though the findings that they generated may cut across a much wider swath of our disorders as we currently think about them. So, a reasonable approach would be to take perhaps two or three different disorders. Uh, and look at the phenomena of interest in that context, but making it clear uh, that this is sort of a preliminary or initial study to get data and that the investigator believes that the approach could cut across a larger number of disorders as well. Another alternative uh, that has been suggested is that if you want to look at the dimensional aspect in terms of severity, one might uh, look at all of the disorders in a particular chapter of the new DSM and ICD metastructure. So for instance, rather than simply picking the index disorder of schizophrenia, one might also include schizoaffective disorder, schizophreniform disorder, transient psychotic episode, et cetera, et cetera, in order to get those uh, you know, somewhat less severe or less persistent kinds of disorders. Uh, I think another important aspect of that, by the way, is that uh, from a public health point of view, those other disorders represent significant impairment in a large percentage of the population, and they are often almost invisible to study because we only tend to study uh, the sort of flagship disorders, if you will. So I hope that gives you an initial idea about that, but as with so many of these things, uh, these are issues where it's a really a good idea to talk with the program staff about uh, coming up with a particular research design that represents a good compromise between size and cost uh, and what you will find out in an initial 
transdiagnostic way. Okay, another question is, how does RDoC impact non-RDoC studies that are already in progress? For example, are there any ways in which those studies should be adapting data collection and analysis plans to incorporate the RDoC framework? Hey, that's a very good question. Um, I think if you are well along in your study, it really depends on uh, how far you have to go as to whether or not you should add any other RDoC-related measures. Uh, in many cases, the answer is no because you wouldn't have the power to analyze those variables uh, well as they combine with the rest of the measures in the research design. However, it certainly makes sense to consider different ways of looking at data analysis uh, to explore RDoC kinds of uh, uh, domains and dimensions. So for instance, uh, again, the vSNP study was not originally uh, designed as an RDoC study. It was funded several years ago uh, and it's only in the light of the data that the investigators have gathered and their innovative analytic techniques uh, that they have found these three biotypes that cut across the DSM disorders uh, and really offer innovative potentials for looking at this spectrum in a way that's very consistent with RDoC, but certainly was not originally designed in those terms at all. Okay, and I think we have time for one last question. Okay. So, how does the RDoC matrix get filled? Would NIMH think, we have these cells filled in the matrix, but we need more research in these other cells? And how would that be communicated to investigators? Okay, so that's a very good question. Uh, you should look at the elements in the matrix, that is the specific measures that are listed in each unit of analysis for each construct as examples uh, of measures that could be used. Uh, that's not to, meant to be exhaustive, as with other aspects of the matrix. This is sort of represents guidelines in a framework, but not the list, and you can't use anything else. Um, however, it's certainly true that there are some cells in the matrix that are blank or sparse, uh, and we would certainly encourage research to fill those out. For instance, if you look at the specific threat construct that has a very large number uh, of elements listed in the matrix because there's so much work been done on specific fear through the work of people like Mike Davis, Joel Ledoux, and others. On the other hand, the potential threat construct uh, is much less well documented, and we think that that could certainly benefit uh, from an accelerating amount of research. So essentially, we are leaving that to the scientific community. It's possible that in the future we might offer some very targeted RFAs towards different areas, but for the most part, uh, we are relying on the research community, uh, as it does now, to think about what the most important research questions are uh, and to come in with studies that will fill in uh, the most critical areas. And so, you know, we again welcome your contacting us to discuss these ideas and uh, discuss our priorities because there are obviously so many different facets of contemporary research that we can't possibly list them all uh, on the website or contextualize them properly. So uh, again, as with so many other areas, uh, that's a question where calling the program staff and discussing these issues is the best advice. Okay, one more question. <laughs> <laughs> one more, just one, one more. more to squeeze in there. So another question is, much current intervention research focuses on improving functional outcomes i.e. employment and relationships, among people with specific disorders. Does this type of research relate to RDoC at all? Yes, actually, uh, the question is about functional, uh, functional outcomes like employment and relationships. Clearly, RDoC is built on these kinds of functions. We are looking at functional capabilities and working memory and other cognitive functions, social functioning, uh, lessening fear, so one is able to go into certain situations. And so this is actually very compatible with RDoC. And of course, these kinds of outcomes do not necessarily go with any one disorder. And again, so much of our clinical work uh, in the past has been related to symptomatic reductions, but the symptom reductions don't necessarily correlate all that strongly with actual functional outcomes. Uh, so in fact, those things are very much compatible with an RDoC approach. Right. Okay, uh, I think that uh, Uma has a few uh, final words, but I just want to thank you again for your time today. Uh, and if you have ideas for future webinars, as we said, this is, we hope, the first in a series.
So we would welcome your suggestions about other webinars that we might hold uh, in the weeks and months ahead. Thank you.